From Washington to Warsaw, Paris to Ankara, Brussels, Berlin, Bucharest, and Belgrade. Through pandemics and political movements, cooperation and confrontation, digital divides, and defending democracy. The German Marshall Fund is at the pulse of transatlantic relations today, convening the experts and insights needed to navigate tomorrow's world. Good morning and welcome. My name is Adam Barbaro. I'm a visiting senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the US and the German Marshall Fund, the GMF digital program. Um, and I welcome you, we've got 90 participants, so a great, a great audience uh, to talk about these, this important topic, uh, cybersecurity and the developments on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, we have an excellent panel assembled to, to give us um, some background on what we're seeing uh, from the private sector side, as well as from the um, from the EU in the um, External Action Service and um, an expert from our Cyberspace Solarium Commission here in the United States to talk about developments in the United States. So uh, rather than bore you with a long introduction about me or the panel um, uh, or the, the background, let me just introduce our panelists really quickly and then uh, we'll jump right in. Oh, let me make one, um, one comment, which is there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you open that up, you can ask uh, questions, please identify yourself uh, and your affiliation in the question, if you would, um, and type those in. And, and I will, um, once we've had a chance to start the conversation, I'll start uh, introducing those questions into the conversation. So I'll begin with uh, Tony Anscombe. Tony's the global security evangelist for ESET. With over 20 years of security industry experience, he's an established author, blogger, and speaker on the current threat landscape, security technologies, and products, data protection, privacy, and trust as well as internet safety. His speaking portfolio includes this, the industry conferences like RSA, CTIA, MEF, Gartner Risk and Security, and the Child Internet Safety Summit. He's regularly quoted in security, technology, and business media, and um, we, we welcome him uh, here with us today. Um, second, Suzanne Spaulding is the Senior Advisor for Homeland Security and the Director of the Defending Democratic Institutions Project at the Center for uh, Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. She also served or serves as a member of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Uh, before joining CSIS, she was the Undersecretary for the National um, Protection and Programs Directorate, now known as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, a uh, component of the Department of Homeland Security, where she oversaw a budget of $3 billion and 18,000 folks uh, in, on staff. Uh, that agency, as everyone probably knows, is charged with, with the strengthening the cybersecurity and critical infrastructure of the United States. Um, joining us also is uh, Vic Victor Stanetsky. Victor recently took on the position as Deputy Head of the Security and Defense Division at the European External Action Service. Before taking on this position, he served as the head of the cyber section at the European External Action Service. And he, before that, he was posted to Tokyo, working in the political section of the EU delegation to Japan. Within the European External Action Service, Mr. Stanetsky has also worked as a desk officer for Brazil and the United States. And before that, he was a consultant stationed in Brussels. Welcome to all of you. So uh, let me start, Tony, with you and just, uh, can you tell us, before we sort of dive into the policy questions, what do you see in terms of the cybersecurity threats and the cybersecurity environment that's, that's sort of changed recently or that's continuous, you know, sort of across time? Sure. Well, firstly, good morning, Adam, and, and good morning to, to everybody on the, on the webinar. And I just want to say I'm, you know, I'm honored to be in such a prestigious company this morning. Um, so there are, of course, lots of ways you can slice threat data and look at cybersecurity issues. And it really depends on, on your viewpoint. And one commonality between everybody on the call this morning is of course we are all consumers. You know, we have our identities to protect and such like, but that, that is not really the topic of this morning's call. So let's, let's get into what it is that we're actually seeing in real time. So um, what we encounter personally is very different. And, and let's look at that bigger picture. And, I'm sure everybody's aware of the recent attack on the water treatment plant down in Florida, where um, it was a good example of an infrastructure attack, whether 
whether the person attacking was truly a, a malicious actor or whether it was a chanced actor, I, I'm, I'm not too sure from, from uh, the discussions that have gone on online. But it was caused by a lack of cyber security placed on a remote access entry point that was actually obsolete. So somebody clearly wasn't following a cyber security framework. Now, interestingly, if we look at the pandemic period, and it's difficult to, to speak on any webinar at the moment and not talk about yet the shift in remote working that was seen from last March through to the end of last year. We, were mon we monitor certain types of threat and we publish uh, the trends in those types of threat uh, on a quarterly basis. And in our Q4 threat report that was actually published just at the middle of last month, uh, we discussed RDP attacks. Now, remote desktop protocol is Microsoft's protocol that's built into the Windows environment. And they actually grew from the start of last year to the end of last year. So from Q1 to Q4 last year, there was a 768% increase in attacks against RDP servers. So you can clearly see that cyber criminals took advantage of the pandemic. So there is a big trend in that type of attack and that is a unique attack. And that's to do with our shift and the dynamic way we all moved home to, to work. So what else are we seeing? Well, we're also seeing an increase in supply chain attacks. And of course, this is quite prevalent and has been in the news a lot recently. Uh, with the likes of SolarWinds, which I'm sure we'll come back to uh, later in the discussion. But if we look at just supply chain attacks and how many we're discovering as a research company, we saw as many in Q4 or discovered as many in Q4 as we would have expected to have seen in a full 12 month period. If you look back over past the past you know, two to three years. Uh, and to give you a, a, an idea of what those look like, those included an attack attributed to the Lazarus Group in South Korea, uh, another in the Able Chat software, uh, which is a popular business suite in Mongolia. Uh, this delivered a backdoor and several remote access Trojans. Uh, this campaign uh, named Operation Stealthy Trident. And lastly, another campaign called Operation Science Site, which was against the government certification authority in Vietnam. Now, Vietnam has extensive use of digital certificates. They're used more you know, by more in society, more in society for validating things than they are in, in most other countries. So this was a significant attack. And these supply chain attacks, it's important to understand. Yeah, you know, a supply chain attack can happen at the earliest moment, uh, yeah, you know, at the at the earliest possible moment in the conception of a product. So yeah, it's like it's like poisoning the water before it even becomes mineral, before it's even extracted as mineral water, uh, before it even is conceived to be in a bottle. And lastly, it, ransomware. Ransomware is always, uh, unfortunately, one of those subjects that doesn't go away. And while there may be a slight decline in the distribution, there's a significant increase in the attacks that include data exfiltration. And this is, a, this is a concerning trend. So no longer is this about somebody encrypting what's on a device and causing dismay and then kind of proliferating that through a network. This is about a cyber criminal entering a network, looking for the valuable asset, uh, then working out what's valuable to the company and what the company may actually pay for, exfiltrating that data, then, because they're already in the network, then potentially switching off uh, protections in the network and then ex uh, yeah, and then launching their ransomware and attack. Now, of course, if the company rightly, and I say rightly because no company should pay, nobody should pay a ransom in this way, uh, decline to pay, or they manage to thwart the attack, as we saw in the Blackboard case here, uh, last year, then the, the cyber criminal unfortunately already has the data and that's the second second start of the attack of, well, if you, want, if you don't want me to publish the data, you're gonna pay me anyway. And uh, the Blackboard one actually is a great example of that where they were paid, the cyber criminal was paid uh, despite the fact that they actually thwarted the, cyber, uh, the ransomware attack. So I think those three things, you know, uh, attacks on uh, remote access, which we're seeing, um, supply chain attacks and ransomware. It's pretty much the trend out there at the moment. 
Excellent. Thank you, Tony. That's a great, that's a great summary. And, um, and let me roll that into the, the first question I'll ask to Victor in terms of um, the EU cyber strategy, which was just released, uh, sort of a collaboration between the European External Action Service and the, and the EU Commission. Um, with, with thinking of those three themes, especially, uh, you know, RDP attacks, the supply chain attacks and, and the increasing prevalence of ransomware, um, especially in, in, the, in light of the pandemic, you know, but also in general, like, can you d describe to us sort of what the EU cyber strategy, and maybe give us a bit of a contrast with how you see it um, comparing to what the US is doing in the same space? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Adam. And, and it's, it's a great pleasure, not only to be here, but also to be in such a company. And I think that uh, uh, what uh, Tony started with, painting the picture of, uh, of the changing that landscape uh, is a very good segue to uh, to uh, uh, to my piece about uh, um, uh, recent uh, uh, joint cybersecurity strategy, because indeed uh, we felt that uh, uh, the uh, especially in, uh, the, the rapid acceleration of 2020 uh, that we saw with uh, with uh, uh, increased reliance on on digital solutions and also unfortunately with a with a uh, increase in. Uh, in uh, threats proliferating both uh, from you know, um, non-state actors, but also state actors uh, made it very timely and important to uh, revise what we had. And this is a third iteration of uh, EU strategies. We had the first one in 2013, second one uh, 2017, and then uh, December uh, 2020, it's a third iteration, uh, takes this into account. And indeed, uh, you know, our approach, um, uh, uh, was uh, to establish that uh, strategy actually uh, to stand on three pillars, uh, which is uh, first pillar, it uh, talks about resilience, technological sovereignty and leadership with uh, 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 precisely also uh, work continuation and, and, and enhancement of work that uh, we as the European Union have been doing on the resilience. Uh, and uh, since 2016, we have uh, put in place a network information security Directive, which uh, now with the new iteration of strategy, we have launched a revision of that uh, uh, of that uh, uh, directive in order to take uh, into account indeed a changing uh, changing landscape, uh, threat landscape. The other elements of uh, of this pillar of resilience, uh, uh, sovereignty, and leadership includes issues related to uh, um, you know creating network of security operation centers. Uh, um, working on the quantum uh, uh, enabled encryption, also sort of recognizing that this is a, a future frontier as well, where we need to uh, pay a lot of attention, uh, which uh, will have an impact on our security. Uh, 5G networks, uh, so uh, continuation and, and uh, intensification of work that has been in place since 2019 on the uh, uh, risk assessment uh, related to 5G, uh, and then also looking ahead how we can uh, make it even better and, and look beyond 5G into 6, uh, 6G. It is also includes elements related to internet security, so uh, domain um, uh, DNS uh, system and uh, supply chain autonomy, uh, mainly focusing on investment and also creating a, 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 a solutions uh, that would help us to have a diversified uh, uh, access to certain uh, technologies and not to be reliant on uh, uh, on uh, uh, a single uh, suppliers and this is not uh, only about you know uh, a security but it's also it's about you know physical security as as the pandemic demonstrated that with uh, with hiccups in the uh, global supply chains we found ourselves uh, uh, missing and, and not having uh, uh, um, com um, some crucial components and lastly skills. So that's the first uh, pillar on uh, on the uh, uh, of the strategy. Second one uh, looks into boosting operational capacity to prevent, deter, and respond to uh, uh, cyber in, uh, uh, incidents, uh, incidents, malicious cyber uh, activities. One part uh, of the work is, um, and I think that we'll uh, dwell on this subject a little bit uh, after uh, Suzanne's uh, intervention, is also how we can improve our coordination. Uh, uh, it is, you know, I, 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 I'm preaching to the converted, but uh, you know very well that uh, cyber is a steam sport. And also it is a very complex issue that involves many actors, both, you know, within the public lands or public administration landscape, but also with the private, uh, private companies. 
so and, and private actors. So uh, we uh, um, idea um, on the European side, launched by the uh, president of the European Commission, is to uh, 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 create a joint cyber unit, so called that would look into a, a, a preparedness, a situ improving situational awareness and coordination. And I think that this is especially given um, uh, nature of the European Union as the uh, international organization that has uh, 27 member states, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, additionally uh, needed uh, in, our, uh, in our sense. Uh, other elements in this um, um, in this part uh, uh, consi um, consist of uh, working as well on, on improving cybercrime uh, um, elements. I think that we have uh, um, uh, some work uh, ongoing with uh, Budapest Convention and negotiating a second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention that helps also international uh, cooperation on, on cybercrime um, uh, issues. And uh, as well, one very important element, very close to our heart as the uh, European External Action Service is um, uh, uh, looking into lessons learned of our cyber diplomacy toolbox. As you might remember in 2017, we did put in place as the European Union cyber joint framework for uh, uh, coordinated responses on, on malicious cyber activities that uh, puts uh, or allows us as the European Union to use all the uh, common foreign and security policy instruments uh, at our disposal, including restrictions. Victor, I don't know if you can hear me. You froze up on us at this point. Um, so while we wait for Victor to come back as an excellent summary of the of the new EU cyber strategy, the third iteration of it, um, let me let me turn to Suzanne and just um, ask her to to give us a little bit of a summary of the, the, the um, um, changes, changes that have taken place in the United States recently on the same place. We have, we have a commissioner from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which is terrific. Um, and, and I know we had as many as 27 of the recommendations that were adopted in the National Defense Authorization Act in December. So um, if you could give us a, a summary of how those developments is, um, are, are going in the United States. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Adam, and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this important conversation today. Um, I, I do uh, applaud the emphasis on finding uh, more and more avenues for collaboration and recognizing uh, our shared goals and shared objectives, um, particularly with our European partners and allies. <clears throat> um, I do, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the ways in which we have divergent approaches to this, and I actually see far more uh, uh, similarities in our approaches um, here. We, you know, we, we, the, you know, Europe, Europe has the NIS directive and now NIS2 uh, that's, that sets forth the state of the art security approaches. And we have the NIST framework that sets forth best practices, industry best practices, but, but you know, lots of similarity there. Um, the divergence that people see, of course, is that the NIS directive is more uh, mandatory. Our NIST standards are voluntary, but it's important to understand that we also have mandates for regulated industries, right? So it's for those industries where we have already recognized that either because there's natural monopolies <clears throat> or for other reasons, there are externalities, there are impacts on the public that will not be adequately taken into account in a straightforward business analysis, <clears throat> impacts on the environment, et cetera, we are going to regulate them. And under President Obama, the instruction to the regulatory agencies, departments and agencies was look at your regulations and see how they could be applied to uh, prompt more uh, uh, robust cybersecurity in those critical industries. So, and they've done so. So there are, I used to uh, have under, uh, when I was at DHS, managed the chemical facility anti-terrorism standards. Uh, and chemical facilities are uh, regulated and part of that regulation is cyber security standards. So, um, so again, not quite as much divergence. I do think there are clearly places where we can learn where, where, where Europe is, is um, perhaps even ahead of us 
in, in some of the thinking, particularly on the identification of particularly critical infrastructure. The Cyberspace Solarium Commission called for the identification of systemically important critical infrastructure, uh, where, we, where it might make sense to uh, impose uh, more obligations and provide greater resources from the government. Uh, and so, and, and the work at DHS to develop national critical functions, I think is moving us in that direction of being able to really identify not just 16 sectors, which is just an organizational construct, but really identify those um, aspects of our critical infrastructure that are, uh, uh, we are most dependent upon uh, and where a disruption could have the most significant impact and how we reduce that and mitigate that. Um, the I loved the emphasis in the EU cybersecurity strategy on resilience. <clears throat> that was something we emphasized very heavily in the Cyberspace Solarium Commission as well. And it's something that I have been pushing uh, through, you know, throughout my time at DHS uh, in what was then NPBD and now CISA, um, is to think about resilience, not just in terms of the resilience of those computer network systems and, and assets of that uh, ICT, that information communication and technology, um, but resilience of the functionality, which is what we're really worried about. We don't care really about computers. We care about the functions they enable. And if you think about it in a very rigorous way, that way, uh, you then it opens up a whole new way of thinking about how you assess those risks and how you mitigate those risks. And so resilience becomes, uh, leads you to paper ballots, for example, an analog solution to the real threat, which is a threat to confidence in the legitimacy of the outcome of the election. It leads you to make sure that you still have hand cranks, to make sure that at your little water facility in Old Smart, Florida, you still have sensors that are mechanical and that you have human operators who are watching. Um, so, so I think that emphasis on resilience is really important and we need to understand the full, full range of it. Um, you know, again, ways in which I think we are consistent having agencies that are focused on critical infrastructure, um, uh, both in the EU and, and in DHS with CISA. Um, I will uh, quickly te te uh, t walk through some of the provisions that were included in the uh, Defense Authorization Act, because we were quite proud at the Cyberspace Solarium Commission that um, I've been on a lot of commissions and they often just gather dust, their reports on a shelf. And because of our four members of Congress, by, by Cameral, House and Senate, and bipartisan, Democrat and Republican, they worked together to push these important reforms through. And cybersecurity has been a, a rare uh, uh, place of bipartisan activity. Um, so really important was a support for our continuity of the economy planning. Um, we have, a, we've long had continuity of government planning, but we recognize that the government needs to be involved in thinking about how we will restart our economy, how we can, uh, you know, uh, focus on the resilience of our economic structures. And so that was included in there. Important provisions on strengthening CISA, recognizing that it is the place to focus on critical infrastructure and interact with the private sector. Um, some joint uh, offices, again, similar to the joint uh, 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 SOCs that Victor mentioned and the other kinds of efforts at bringing in at more jointness. So a joint planning office at CISA was, was in the NDAA and the Defense Authorization Act. And that would include the private sector. So a really important part of that joint planning office <clears throat> it's not just the interagency, but also the private sector. Important authority for CISA to do threat hunting, just on federal systems, not in the private sector, not, not go into private sector um, networks, but in the federal government uh, to be able to go in and do threat hunting uh, more quickly so that when something like solar winds happens, you can more quickly identify which departments and agencies may have been affected, for example. Um, uh, the, the, um, there, there are recommendations in there on the cyber workforce, and I know that's something, Adam, that you want to talk about as we go along, but those were some of the key, and perhaps the most important is the National Cybersecurity Director. 
um, which would be which would restore in many ways cyber uh, coordination across our government and with the private sector uh, with out of the White House, um, but with a much more robust office than has ever been there before. Excellent. You know, thank you for that that summary. That summary. Uh, let me pick up. There's um. There we starting to get some questions, questions from the audience. The audience. So, so rather than, rather than pose my uh, my views on this. On this. Uh, there's uh, a question, question here, here, picking up on Suzanne, on your, your point your about point the about definition of critical, critical um, um, sorry, critically, systematically important critical infrastructure. Um, um, you know, one of the you know, things, that things that I've observed, I've observed is that, is that you know, critical, critical infrastructure, infrastructure we, we, struggle we struggle really, really to, figure to figure out what, what is critical infrastructure and to, to, and to, to not have that, that, that definition, definition expand to such an extent that you wind up defining almost everything in. Um, I think we saw this with the pandemic yeah, where, where, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe retail, retail was, was sort of thought, sort of thought of infrastructure, of infrastructure, but probably wouldn't have made the narrow, from an organizational, organizational perspective, wouldn't have made the, 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 core, the core definition. definition. But, it, but it clearly it is. Really is right? Right? And, right. and, and having, having the frontline this. workers actually delivering services to us is That's incredibly important. important. Um, um, so, so, so in the... So in the NDA, the or, or in the Cyberspace Solarium Commission report, the expansion or the narrowing, narrowing to, the to the focus on focus the on strategically, strategically um, um, important critical infrastructure. In the, in the EU, EU cyber, cyber strategy, strategy I, see the, I, see the, I see the other I see the other direction. direction. I, see I see the expansion, expansion of, of local entities, entities to be sort of a sort of a is this is is there a conflict there or is this sort of or things or things getting getting same sort of aperture aperture sides of the Atlantic. So it's a little hard to tell, but I would venture to guess that it is a signal that in some ways Europe is more mature along this line than we are. Um, so, so I would start uh, because I, my guess is that we will start narrow, if, if, you know, with SICI, we, uh, unfortunate acronym, but systemically important critical infrastructure, uh, that we will start with that as relatively narrow as we work our way forward in terms of what are the corresponding obligations and, and responsibilities of those folks and what are the resources and help that we are going to give them because we have prioritized them because of their potential for impact on, on our nation. Um, and that as we go forward, we'll realize that there are more and more that fit into that category. So, uh, you know, Victor can address this, but, uh, but it may be that that's what we're seeing happen in Europe. And I think that's a, a sign of of, of maturity, not, not regression, if you will. The other thing I think is really important to, you know, we talk about, I hear this a lot, um, Adam, that, you know, we've defined everything as critical infrastructure, so nothing is critical. And, and what I always caution is there's, don't mistake our organizational construct in which we've created 16, 17, if you count election infrastructure, I guess, um, uh, sectors with, you know, an organizational structure on the government side and the private sector side to, to mean to replace the actual definition of critical infrastructure, which is systems, assets, and networks, whether physical or virtual, the disruption of which would have a, a significant impact on national security, economic security, or public health and safety. So that's when, the, when DHS at the National Risk Management Center is focusing on national critical functions they're working from that definition, not from the sector construct, right? What are the things, and, and it takes into account those interdependencies between the sectors, the prospect for cascading consequences, et cetera, to figure out what are the most important uh, functions. And that's that systemically important critical infrastructure. And, and again, that's not all we're gonna focus on. So yes, you have to have a very wide aperture uh, when you're looking at what, where you need to provide guidance, best practices, uh, help for small and medium-sized businesses. We see time and time again that those third-party vendors that wouldn't be on a necessarily, solar winds might be on a systemically important critical infrastructure, but plenty of the folks that are vectors uh, for causing significant disruption would never be on that list. So you've got to do both. Understood. Understood. Got it. Got it. Susan, can Susan, you can you mute, can you mute when you're not speaking? I think we're getting a little bit of an echo. 
Yeah, and I'm happy, Adam, if uh, to come uh, uh, come back on uh, on uh, what Suzanne said about uh, about differences, and I, I I think that you know in one way it is a difference, of course, uh, uh, but at the same time I I think that it's uh, it's also uh, flows from different uh, different uh, approaches. I mean, we are uh, within the European Union, we we are diverse as well as member states, and I think that uh, one of the examples I'll give uh, uh, you know when we had uh, uh, when the uh, uh, NIS uh, directive has been adopted and, uh, and member states uh, also uh, uh, started to uh, define uh, um, uh, essential services as, uh, um, as, as defined in the uh, uh, NIS directive. I think that some, if I remember correctly, Finland, for example, proposed to have uh, GPs, so general practitioners, doctors, as, uh, as essential service. And I think that, you know, it also shows that, uh, that uh, this definition will be changing. And I think that what is important is that uh, to maintain that there is a some certain degree of flexibility and the review clause that we indeed, you know, uh, learning through um, events like a COVID pandemic, we also reassess uh, um, what is uh, what is uh, essential and what is not. I think that we fully would agree, uh, find agreement. There are certain uh, uh, services uh, that uh, that would be always uh, uh, crucial, like uh, electricity grids uh, and, and and whatnot. But uh, I think that for the rest, it has to remain to to a large degree as well fluid in order to allow uh, flexibility that will be uh, will be changing depending as well on 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 the uh, on the uh, progression uh, of the digitalization and 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 the more uh, uh, integration of uh, of uh, uh, digital solutions in our daily lives and and also um, uh, uh, um, uh, national sort of functions security functions of the state and and other societal functions. Excellent. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear a lot of convergence there, a lot of like sophistication in the way you have to think about this, not just as like a single Venn diagram that either gets bigger or smaller, but really some some layers. Tony, I don't know if you wanted to to weigh in or, or jump in on any of that um, to comment on sort of how it, how it looks from the private sector. Well, I think the one thing I'd add is, um, you know, go governments have views on, on their nation and as a private company and who one does business around the globe, um, you know, maybe we see things slightly more holistically because we're working in every, every country that we're appearing. So, and actually one of the things I'd, you know, I'd add into, I think uh, it was Victor that said when he, we, when he first spoke was, you know, cybersecurity is about team. So this isn't to me about one, one government policy or another government's policy in another region. Actually, cybersecurity people tend to all have a common goal. And that common goal is to stop bad actors. And you know, if you go to any conference or you go to any event and you see cybersecurity people huddled in a corner, they typically are from competitors. They're from different regions in the world. And that common goal can be seen right there. And they collaborate. And yeah, they share, the, they share information around how they're stopping attacks and, and what they're seeing. And that actually provides protection beyond that. And actually, it's great to see two, you know, two regions, so the US and the, and the EU, having policies and having overlap in those policies and talking about the overlap and how to work together, because that's important. And that's what makes cybersecurity such an interesting area because it kind of crosses those boundaries and the internet one thing the internet's done for everybody isn't it is remove geographical boundaries in that way i mean it's kind of normalized the world ac across the world and i know that's not strictly true in every country by the way but i mean generally so i think it's great to see these two policies come together and, and the convergence great no, that's that's a that's an excellent point and, and on, on that point, just building on that in terms of talking about cyber diplomacy, if you will, talking about the, the, the need to cooperate, which I think is, is very clearly stated uh, in the Cyberspace Solarium Commission report, recommendations for elevating that, that work at the U.S. State Department. And obviously, it's, it's clearly there in terms of joint action, but also in terms of outreach uh, in the cybersecurity strategy. Um, can, we, can we talk a little bit about how the transatlantic partners can work together and um, provoke, promote more of an international framework for an open, free, and secure cyberspace beyond just the US and the EU. 
Um, and to what extent can, can new formats, like um, President Biden has proposed a summit of democracies as another, as another international uh, grouping to, to, to get together and talk around shared values. Um, is that, can that be part of, you know, do, do you view cyber as maybe a, a significant plank of the work that would take place in such an organization? And I'll, I'll let you guys find out who wants to jump in first. I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to start because it's actually uh, very neatly. Uh, not only uh, brings me to my home turf, but also uh, also allows me to kind of like push uh, unfinished business of uh, of uh, talking a little bit about the strategy. Because precisely the the sort of the third pillar that I couldn't uh, couldn't tell you about uh, 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 talks about the advancing global and open cyberspace, and I think that very much. I would, uh, I would agree uh, with what Tony said about the common goal, uh, um, at least between uh, like-minded countries, is that we want to see a, a global, free, open, uh, stable and secure internet. And I think that uh, we should never, you know, uh, when talking about security and kind of like malicious actors and, kind, uh, you know, having those negative... Uh, terms sometimes we should not forget as well that uh, that we have uh, this objective of uh, of uh, um, uh, using the full potential that uh, that uh, cyberspace gives uh, our societies our citizens uh, to uh, uh, to flourish both economically and and also uh, personally in terms of uh, uh, their uh, exercising their human rights and and fundamental freedoms and I think that uh, absolutely in this sense, cooperation uh, is is essential and I think that uh, with the US it's easy because we uh, really uh, uh, share those common values and, and goals and we see eye to eye uh, on uh, on uh, um, um, nearly virtually everything so uh, so uh, that's uh, that's relatively easy but as, as well it is important that both us as the EU and the United States cooperating together, we uh, widen that circle of, uh, of like-minded countries. We widen the circle by building uh, uh, first bridges in terms of uh, capacity to understand and participate in the uh, uh, discussions, but also that we, uh, we nurture uh, functioning international community, and this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, done also by investing into uh, multilateral discussions that are ongoing about uh, uh, international security aspects of cyberspace uh, in the United Nations. So I think that we, uh, we have uh, a special role uh, as, uh, as uh, leading nations uh, or regions or uh, countries to also um, uh, share our uh, capacity uh, and, uh, and help others to, uh, uh, to participate in these discussions and, uh, and through that transfer our uh, values and, uh, and outlook uh, into uh, norms. Uh, and I think that we can, uh, we can speak about that later as well, about, you know, uh, about the uh, norms of responsible state behavior. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I completely agree. And of course the Cyberspace Solarium Commission uh, emphasized how important it is for, uh, for, for the United States to recognize in its actions and its policies uh, that we cannot do this alone and how important it is uh, to be engaged uh, with our partners and allies and those around the world. And, and one of the key recommendations in that regard, of course, was to um, again, bring back as a, as a senior position in the State Department that cyber diplomacy office and to establish a, uh, uh, an ambassador level position for cybersecurity at the State Department. And, this, and I was pleased to see the Cyber Diplomacy Act reintroduced in Congress. And, and I think there's a pretty strong consensus that this is really important. And, um, and part of that is to, is to make sure that we have a strategy for our international engagements, what is it that we are trying to achieve collectively, and how can we do you you know do that through these international relations? And part of that is our involvement in standards groups, which has been really not where it needs to be uh, from the United States perspective. And again, this is an instance where the State Department needs to lead our development of an international strategy and coordinate those efforts with the backing and support of the National Cyber Director out of the White House. But, but others will have important roles to play, including NIST in those standards activities, including CISA at DHS in the CERT to CERT conversations and capacity building that they've been doing for years around the world. Um, so that distributed 
uh, expertise and resources and authorities needs to continue across the US government and just as it does across the EU member states. Uh, but, it's, but it's got to come together at the key places and it's gotta be done in a way that is, is uh, coordinated and strategic. And so I, you know, I, as I hear you, Victor, and, and you know, read through the challenges that the EU, the, the way the EU interacts with the member states, um, it resonates a lot with me having been uh, you know, leading the group at DHS that tried to coordinate across the interagency, uh, for example. Um, there are places where you can be directive and we have binding operational directives and there are other places where you, you, know, need, you can provide common tools and capacities. And then you have to recognize that there are different missions, different kinds of expertise, different equities at stake and, and you've got to uh, you know, let, let, let that drive you toward excellence in a coordinated way. Can I, I'd like to keep us in the international sphere on the next question. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask it from the audience. Uh, I think I had, I had one in my notebook as well, but, uh, but, but uh, prefer to, to do the audience question. Um, so Carolina Ange from the NGO Independent Diplomat says, asks, what role do you see for the UN GGE and OEWG processes in strengthening global cybersecurity? And how can states work together to curb attacks, especially on critical infrastructure? So I think we've talked a little bit about the, the cooperation of states, but, but in terms of, and Victor, you mentioned the norms uh, building process at the end of your, your answer there, like, you know, wh what, is the, what is the future there? I and mean, we've talked a lot about the, the, the common set of values and the fact that we're, we are in a good position to work together and build the, the community of like-minded nations and like-minded um, delegations. But, but, but what is, sort of what's your take on what's happening at the UN right now? Yeah, it's a very timely uh, question because uh, as uh, uh, many of you uh, know, uh, next week, uh, the open-ended working group uh, uh, will have uh, uh, its um, uh, uh, long meeting to uh, establish and agree on uh, a final report uh, of the process that has been launched in 2019. And uh, NGGE as well. Uh, I think it's a little bit later in May, but uh, by, by summer this year, we should have two reports uh, coming out of uh, both groups, a uh, uh, group of governmental experts and uh, an open-ended working group, precisely that will dwell into uh, uh, questions on the uh, on the promotion of norms of responsible state behavior that are in place and have been in, uh, put in place uh, by uh, a sub a subsequent reports of the group of governmental experts in 2013, 2015, and approved by whole uh, UN General Assembly. So actually, they are approved by every uh, member state of the uh, of the United Nations, and that's very important to uh, highlight. But of course, you know, I, I, uh, uh, still further work is needed, both in socializing, uh, as I as I mentioned, flagged, uh, so the whole international community into a, a awareness of these norms, and also uh, also uh, making it very concrete uh, proposals to uh, uh, how they should be implemented, how they. Uh, how they translate into a uh, into uh, state to state uh, relations. So what we are looking as the European Union for the as and our member states as the objective uh, for uh, for this process and and also for the next uh, years is both to safeguard the uh, uh, very good uh, basis that uh, we what we call a key that we have uh, established uh, as the international community up to up to now. Uh, and then also uh, uh, take it a uh, uh, little bit further, and this is uh, translated in our idea of having a program of action established uh, within the United Nations to actually look into a concrete implementation of, uh, of different strands. And this is mainly due as well, uh, 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 recognizes the importance of uh, uh, capacity building as as this uh, transmitter or enabler of uh, of engagement. So, what are we in terms of of uh, a key? I mentioned norms, but other important element is as well. It's the uh, applicability of uh, international law in cyberspace and uh, as well international humanitarian law, which is a bedrock of really of our relations. And this is a very uh, important uh, component that uh, allows as well uh, accountability. Uh, to be uh, in place. 
it is a long subject, very, uh, you know, I could go on for longer, but I'll stop here just, uh, just in the interest of the time. But these are the key elements I would highlight. And maybe just, just last, uh, because it, the question comes from the NGO. And I think that last element that is very important in this whole discussion is that, of course, this is state to state discussion predominantly. However, uh, it also involves in many sessions of uh, uh, deliberations in the United Nations also involve multi-stakeholder community. And it's important that we, uh, we uh, uh, do not forget that uh, other players such as NGOs, such as academia, private sector, have, uh, should also have a, a platform, a voice in this process uh, um, uh, uh, moving forward. And I was gonna, Suzanne, I mean, I'm happy to let, let you jump in on that, but I was gonna also see if I could bring Tony into the conversation. Um, you know, uh, Brad Smith testified three times last week on Capitol Hill, Brad Smith, the president and the chief legal officer of Microsoft, of course. I was there in, it was 2017, 2018 at RSA where he announced the, the, the private sector norm building activity. And obviously, you know, we talk a lot about the platforms and the, and the internet companies that have such, um, such a role to play in cyberspace. Um, for, for better or worse, but, but you know, Tony, I'd be interested in, in your take on, on the private sector side of this sort of norms building activity and, and you know, um, pushing, pushing governments and, and taking responsibility themselves to, 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 um, to behave responsibly in this space. Well, and, and of course, there should be responsible behavior in, in the space with, without question. And, uh, you know, as a, as a company, we're for example, a member, a signatory of the Cyber Tech Accord, which, as I recall, was announced by Brad at RSA a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a proud member and an active member of that organization. Um, I just want to pick up on something Victor said, actually, about he, he kind of mentioned regulation and legislation and different countries in, in there. I think one of the important things yeah, as a cybersecurity company is that we do have a voice. And as Victor said, it's good that we, you know, we should have a voice. Uh, and let me give you an example of that. You know, regulation has changed in privacy law around, you know, in the last five years, we've seen you know, huge changes in privacy law with GDPR. And, uh, you know, I'm based in California, you've got CCPA and you've got other privacy legislation around the world. And let me give you an example of something where actually cybersecurity suffers for some regulation and legislation. And this is why we need to be at that table, right? So something like who is. Um, now who is, is, you know, you get that domain and you can look up some details about the domain, where it was registered, how it was to register, registered and who buy and um, such like. But under GDPR, cybersecurity companies can no longer see that information because it's personal information. And this is where, when governments come together uh, or legislation is, is uh, imposed that affects cyber security, either the securing of information or the potential research of issues, then actually, you know, that's where it's important to have private industry and the cyber security research community sitting on the sidelines and saying, if you do this, it could affect this, it could change how we detect things or determine things. And that's just, yeah, that's just one example. And it's a very, pre yeah, it's a, unfortunately a very prevalent example. Um, and it's interesting that the EU policy uh, does in fact include some proposals for an EU based ICANN and DNS. Uh, and I don't know all the implications of that proposal because does that help or does that hinder? I, I'm, at this moment in time, I'm not so sure, but I'd urge, you know, come and talk to private industry and make sure that whatever is done actually doesn't stop cyber security uh, research. No, no, I think, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think, um, and obviously there's, there's some of that in all of these proposals, right? The, the cyber strategy in the, in the EU and um, uh, Suzanne, you highlighted several of the, um, or at least probably several of the NDAA provisions include things that bring private sector in to this joint, to these joint centers. Um, but but that's an it's always it's always a good reminder that you know getting as much input as possible is really required to to make sure that we don't wind up with unintended consequences like like the who uh, like the who is uh, problem. Uh, let me turn. We have a few more questions from the audience, so I want to make sure we get through those before we run out of time. Um, what um, to 
from uh, Tyson Barker asks, do what, to what extent do EU member states see election systems as critical infrastructure? Germany and France are entering into back-to-back -back election cycles in the next two years. Are there any lessons from CISA that the European cyber agencies in the EU can take? And I guess, Victor, I'll, I'll throw that to you to begin with. Yeah, okay. I, I, but I think that uh, it would be great as well to uh, uh, hear from Suzanne. I, I think that's uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, um, uh, when you um, uh, look back into uh, 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 past elections, uh, and especially on the back of 2016 uh, US elections, there was a very strong realization that indeed uh, this uh, requires a lot of attention. And, uh, and uh, ahead of the big uh, uh, European uh, uh, Parliament elections in 2019, if I remember correctly, there was a whole process launched ahead of that uh, to uh, uh, precisely look into the uh, security um, elements, and uh, which went broadly, just not uh, not only cybersecurity elements, but also included disinformation. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, and and uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, I'll give you another example I mentioned, uh, or, or I mentioned at least uh, talking to the screen, I don't know if we're cut, cut there or not, I was talking about the cyber diplomacy toolbox and uh, that it allows also use of restrictive measures and, uh, and uh, um, uh, you know, elections is one part of, as well uh, that, uh, that are identified as, uh, as, uh, as cause uh, uh, for uh, imposition of such uh, restrictive measures if, if, uh, if there is, a, um, uh, if there is a such an incident. So, but thankfully, I think that either for, uh, from our preparedness, but we avoided, uh, we avoided major incidents uh, um, back then, but it doesn't mean that you know, the, uh, the threat does go away. Yeah, uh, and I, I think, as I alluded to earlier, I think elections are a really good example of, of how we need to kind of broaden our thinking about uh, cybersecurity and, and building resilience. Um, because, uh, you know, what we realized in 2016 when we saw the malicious cyber activity around voter registration databases was uh, our first thought was, oh, you know, they're trying to get confidential information about individuals in those databases. And we very quickly realized, no, actually that's not really sensitive information. Most of it's public. Um, and quickly realized that, that what you really could do was disrupt the election, uh, which would cause the public potentially to lose confidence in the legitimacy of the process and therefore in the legitimacy of the outcome. So understanding your adversary's objective is a really important aspect of countering their activity uh, because you, you don't want to just counter their technical access to your election infrastructure. You do. You want to do everything you can on that. But you want to understand what is it they're trying to achieve and what are all the ways that you can frustrate their ability to achieve that objective. And again, it led us very quickly to how important paper ballots are, how important audit trails are, how important it is to be able to reassure the American public about what happened in the election. The disinformation piece is obviously hugely important. And again, thinking about not just the technical ways in which you work with the platforms to identify inauthentic accounts and take those down, et cetera, um, building media literacy is really important, but so is building public resilience against the pernicious messaging, against the content, right? What is your, what is your object, what is your adversary trying to do? Not, you know, I've spent three and a half years looking at how Putin is undermining public faith and confidence in our justice system, for example. Um, but looking at the information operations uh, coming out of Russia, the goal is to get, a, it is to rob us of an informed and engaged citizenry upon which a democracy depends. To get us to give up on the idea of truth and, and being able to be informed and to get us to give, give up on our ability to bring about change, uh, give up on the idea that, that our democracy is, is susceptible to change, right? That, Instead, it is irrevocably broken and you cannot use constitutional means to bring about change. And there, and, and the court decisions, 60 plus court decisions that rejected challenges to the legitimacy of the election, ignored, right? Because uh, in part of disinformation, not, not just from Russia by any means, domestic voices uh, play a huge role here. Um, but it's really important as you think about this, so then how do you counter that? 
And I think one of the most important ways in the United States, and I've seen this uh, being done much more effectively in some of our European uh, allies, is, is a reinvigoration of civics education. <clears throat> to remind us of our shared values, of our shared identity. Uh, and this is why I think the summit of the democracies, it absolutely should be on the agenda. Um, it is important to remind people that democracy is worth fighting for. It's under attack, it must be fought for. It's worth fighting for, not because it's perfect, far from it, but because it is capable of change. That is the key. Uh, and so then you have to empower individuals to be more effective agents of change, to hold those institutions accountable. And as you begin to do that, you can begin to rebuild trust in those sources of information, courts, which are arbiters of fact and truth, the media, um, you can begin to get pe help people recognize the constitutional ways in which they can bring about change rather than an insurrection at the Capitol. Well, Suzanne, uh, thank you for that because now I feel, I feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that be and let you have the last word on that because I think that um, in a couple of ways, I mean, first of all, I think it's, a, it's an inspiring message to take us into the weekend. Um, uh, and I think it reminds us that, you know, especially those of us who are in this industry, we spend a lot of time at our keyboards thinking about computers and networks. Um, and I think you alluded to this early, early on. This is about, this is about reality. This is about the shared reality that we have. It's about the way we, we go through the world, not the cyber world, but the real world and like, and the impacts of what we're doing. Um, this is, is not a video game, right? It's, it's, it's the impact that it has on our democracy, on our society. Um, the incredible benefits that we have all, uh, that we all share in from having these digitally enabled services. Um, and they just, they need to be secure um, and, and protect, uh, protect things and protect our privacy and, and our security at the same time. So, so thank you for, thank you for your words. Thank you uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you to Victor as well. And to Tony for joining us. Uh, thanks to the, um, to the audience. Uh, we didn't get quite get to all the questions, but I think we covered a lot of a really important ground here. And, um, and I just uh, I wish you all a very good day and a very good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.